We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, and that's not Emily. I'm not Emily. This is this is Adam, <laughs> who is co-hosting for Emily, because Emily is moving out of Argentina. Hello, um, everybody. <laughs> welcome to the podcast, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Happy to be here. Yes. Yes. I, I, I said, are you going to come on the podcast this week because I need a co-host? And you said yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Anytime. So before we dive in, we have to talk a little bit about how you got into Formula One and why it's basically just my fault. Um, everybody knows how I got into Formula One. If you <laughs> watched our first episode, you know how I got into Formula One and yes. all of that history um, because we've lived it. Um, but how was it by- I was how, there how did you for get you into getting it? into Formula One. You were indeed, um, <laughs> among other things. So assuming you know how Catherine got into Formula One uh, during the summer summer camp. Um, a camp that I used to work at and am good friends, uh, best friends with Catherine through. Uh, when we got home from camp, Catherine went, you know what? I need someone at home to watch Formula One with. And here I was. Uh, so it started with her just saying, hey, I need someone to talk to this while it's going on. And I said, sure. You know, I'm a sports fan. I'm mostly hockey, uh, a little bit of odd sports here and there. And I started watching it and it just got like, as soon as I started to learn who people were and started to learn the sport it got really exciting it got really fun uh as soon as i figured out who people were and who my teams were and who i liked and who i didn't like and all that jazz so uh that was a lot of fun i got into it a couple years ago and uh, being able to go back and catch up through drive to survive i think drive to survive came after i became a fan but helped mm -hmm. me become more of a fan which was kind of a kind of a cool different like so many people now are getting into it because of drive to survive it was fun watching drive to survive someone who was already like kind of a fan so that was fun yeah because yeah. i also obviously i started you know watching races and then was told hey you should watch drive to survive too right and so that that worked too yeah i got you into formula one and you got me into pro hockey so basically we just we just enable each other when it gets in when we get into sports we, do. we go back and forth i drag you to one you drag me to the other and it's we both have fun so Pretty much. So we know my favorite teams. I'm the Red Bull girly. Um, yes. Who are your favorite teams and drivers on the grid? Uh, when I first got into Formula One, I thought it was going to be Red Bull because I am an endurance athlete. I love endurance sports. Uh, watching Red Bull be Red Bull is exciting anywhere. Uh, but my first ever intro into Formula One, not really become a fan, but my first like, oh, this is a thing, was the movie Rush many years mm -hmm. ago. Um, so watching that, I always loved James Hunt, and I kind of love fell in love with that story, which is kind of a precursor to ever actually being a Formula One fan. Uh, but watching McLaren through that was a lot of fun. And then coming in now, uh, watching McLaren, uh, it's hard to join and say, oh, I'm going to join and instantly become a fan of, you know, the team that's hard to beat right now, because it's fun to watch a team grow. And at the moment, it doesn't seem like there's a ton of growth for Red Bull. So I think my favorite team right now is McLaren. Um, and with that, I have said, uh, Catherine will laugh when I always say this, my favorite driver on the grid <laughs> is uh, Lando Norris. He's fun to watch. Watching him win his first race in Miami was a joy of sports. Um, he's professional. He always He's a good driver. He's fun to watch. My favorite person on the grid um which is yeah. different which is different valtteri botas watching him uh the commercials for australia and kind of be adopted in australia is hilarious uh watching who he is um uh, i think he's he's my favorite person to follow off grid my favorite person to follow just in the world um right. is valtteri botas but i definitely uh have to go with lando norris as my favorite driver on the grid who do i want That's to win the race I think Lando Norris. So yeah, and let's be real, and let's be real. You and I, we did watch Miami at your mom's house, and we did. that was just that was a top tier quality race. And then I had to oh, say, be like, I need to lock myself in your mom's office so that I can record a podcast and talk because about we were this watching for playoff an hour <laughs> right yeah. after. Yeah, yeah, that was a, that busy was a day fun of race. Sports. It was fun to watch him win. So very happy. Yeah. Yeah. So now that we know who you are and all of this fun stuff, let's dive mm -hmm. in to some of the news of the week. There's not a lot of news news because we just had a race 
four days ago. I know. Um, but there is some pretty significant. I love this three views. race period. It's very exciting. <laughs> Oh my God, this is, this is so much. And like, there's some campers here who are F1 fans who are like, of course we're at camp the same time as the there's triple header races. of the season. Yeah. Yeah. So diving into Emily's favorite topic of news of the week, it's contracts updates. And we had two <laughs> pretty big announcements of contracts updates this morning. Um, it is Thursday as we record this. Um, right. First of all, we have to talk about the least surprising contract update. <laughs> I was going to say, if that's, if that's big news, then... <laughs> It's it's big news as in it is finally confirmed. Lance Stroll right. has signed a multi-year extension of his unlimited contract uh -huh. through at least the 2026 season. Um they they haven't really come out with the duration, but they have said they have implied that it will be through the new regulation, which would mean that he would stay on through at least 26. Right. I just like it's the expected move, but I don't love it. I it's you know, I actually like it more now than I would have at the beginning of the season. Okay. Um, he, ever since I became a fan, he has always struck me as the pay-to-drive driver. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he kind of has become the poster boy for the pay-to-drive driver. Uh, and while he, I think he struggles a lot more on his own, I think he can take advantage of a situation a little bit better. I got to remember the graph that I saw, but uh, he's one of the leaders in F1 right now in overtakes in races. Right. So I think you got to give him a little bit of credit for that. He's a good driver. He just can't position himself well leading into the races. I think he can take advantage of other people on the track. Um, but I think he has trouble in qualifying and getting himself set up into a position where he doesn't have to overtake to finish out of the points. So, right. yeah, I think if, uh, if they had, if Aston Martin had a better driver, they would be going not, I mean, they wouldn't be going with them. That's kind of the point. Um, but I think that with the pool of drivers available, unless they could find a way to get Carlos Sainz, uh, he's one of the next best options. Um, yeah, it's like he's clearly good enough to be on the grid and to stay on the grid. But for where Aston Martin is positioning themselves, and especially based on like their performance the first half of last year, um, you know, wanting to position themselves as a top team and not just a top of the midfield team, they right. are going to have to move on from Lance at some point. And, you know, Daddy Stroll is going to have to make some tough decisions. That's true. And that's going to be a hard conversation that they're going to have to have one day if they ever want to be the competitive team that uh, Daddy Stroll claims they want to be. Because he is a exactly. good driver, but he's a really good middle-of-the-pack driver. A lot of his overtakes have been teams that have one or two or no points this season. So mm -hmm. I think that he's, for where they are right now, I think he's a fine pick. I think he's fine for where the team exists, but I don't think he's the right person for where the team wants to go. Right. And I've talked in previous episodes about how, you know, my thought is that when Honda comes in in 26 as their engine supplier, they need to take mm -hmm. Yuki Tsunoda with them from, you know, Visa Cash App RB, um, which makes it really interesting to think about because they gave, you know, Stroll a multi-year extension. Yuki's extension right. is only through 25 to the end of, you know, this current regulation. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, where would that availability be? Because as I have also said, there is no way Helmut Marco mm -hmm. is ever going to consider like letting Yuki Tsunoda in the main Red Bull team. Right. And I think that uh, from Visa card, Cash App, RB uh, shenanigans, I, I have a hard time with yeah. these long names just like wanting to pronounce Because them. they're absurd. Because <laughs> they're absurd. They're ridiculous. Um, I think that this, I think that moving to Aston Martin would be a good thing for his career, uh, like you said, with Honda, with the assumption that he's never going to get the seat at Red Bull. I think if there's some inside knowledge that we don't know, uh, that, oh, maybe he will get a chance to drive for, like, Red Bull proper. Uh, if that's never going to come, I think that Aston Martin would be a good upgrade. And yeah, staying with that Honda family, I think would be easy, an easy decision. Yeah, because the thing is, is that Yuki being at Visa Cash App RB has been so political and is so just purely based on the fact that he is Honda's driver. Um, as opposed to, right. you know, obviously he's part of the Red Bull family, but his contract is paid by Honda. You know, he, you know, the <laughs> relationship with Honda stems on Yuki being in a Red Bull family seat, but they're not going to take him to the main Red Bull team. He's always going to be a junior team driver unless he goes somewhere else. Yuki Tsunoda is the uncle that shows up that one day the kids go, is he actually related? And everyone goes, 
well, and then just moves on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, like like me with your future children. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of confusion in the future there. So basically the point is, and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Aston Martin, because obviously Fernando Alonso's contract is, I think, also through 26, but is not also con- like guaranteed a drive. And he might turn into that like um, Nikki Lauda-esque advisor role within a few years. So it'll be right. really interesting to see what they end up, you know, actually doing. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him announce his retirement coming up. Um, yeah. I mean, he with could, a few see, years he could left- see that next year and go off the sunset exactly he's been in the in the game for so long um there's plenty in formula one that he could do there's plenty of teams that would love to have him as an advisor role love to have him somewhere in the organization uh that i i don't if he decides to retire i don't think it would be a surprise no definitely not i mean we love having on the him on the grid we love you know reminding everybody that he's a thousand years old and <laughs> in, in you know in right. driver standards um but Yes, it'll be really interesting to see, and it could pave the way for Yuki to take Fernando's seat if they're insistent exactly. on letting Lance stay and continue to be a middling driver for a team that has a lot of potential. I think the chances of them saying, uh, Fernando, we love you, but we think it's time you retire and take this position so that we can get Yuki in is much more likely, likely than them ever saying uh, goodbye to Lance. Um, is yeah. that what they should do if they want to no. be as successful as they claim? Absolutely not. But I see that being a more likely, uh, more likely alternative. Exactly. So moving on from Aston Martin, Pierre Gasly has also unsurprisingly extended with Alpine. You know, it was kind of, we, we kind of thought at the beginning of the season, like which French driver was going to stay or which one was going to right. leave. And then clearly after Monaco, we knew Acon's out. So of course they're going to keep Gasly for that, you know, consistency, that continuance, um, especially in light of everything going on at Alpine and how ridiculous they are. They'll want that consistency in one of their drivers. Um, and so we'll, they'll, we'll have him there for a couple more years. But the real question on everybody's mind is who is going to team up with Gasly in 2025? Right. Uh, I think that's the question right now. And I think that, honestly, the entire world of Formula One is at a standstill. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as drivers moving, everyone is waiting for Carlos Sainz to announce where he's going. Um, Yeah. I've I've heard that Alpine's trying to poach him. Um, Are they the best fit for him? I don't know. No. Uh, But no, (laughs) I'm trying to be polite here. Uh, We're not nice on this podcast. (laughs) You know what I think of Alpine. but yeah. I think that I think that every team has to hold their breath and every team has to say, uh, you know, if there's a chance we can get Carlos signs, we have to put everything on the back burner until we know whether or not that's going to happen. So um, I think that there's some awesome uh, there's some great names out there, either both people who have been in the sport before and people who are new and developing and coming up. But I really don't think until Carlos tells us where he's going, which I don't think he even knows yet. Um, no, I mean, probably not. I mean, and, and Flavio Briatore, who is, you know, was with Renault, is now back at Alpine since he has been unbanned for life from Formula <laughs> One because that's right. how Formula One works. Um, he he kind of, you know, decided to sweep in at the last minute and direct the Alpine CEO to give Carlos an offer um, mm-hmm. while he's also courting the offers from Sauber and Audi and Williams. Um, right. So really it's Carlos needs to hurry the hell up because he's driving us all crazy, which is what Emily and I have been talking about for almost you know months now. Yeah. And he's not going to be able to play this game. Uh, not that he's playing a game, but he's not going to be able to play this game as long as I think he thinks he is. Uh, it's going to get to a point really quick where teams have got to make decisions and teams have got to move. And if he's uncommitted, they're going to go with someone who is. Um, Not to say that the teams he wants to go on will have to make that decision, but uh, that decision is going to have to be made with or without him. So hopefully he comes to a decision before uh, someone has to say, well, see you later. Yeah, and I I mean... Emily's really worried about that. We've talked about that a lot, but I I don't think that the teams are dumb enough to let a a driver at Carlos's caliber just go. Um, You know, we've, we've always said that Carlos is probably one of the most underrated drivers on the grid um, because for some reason, people think that Charles Leclerc, who is a great driver at Ferrari is 
better right. than Carlos, which I just still don't see. I, I don't understand how that works. Um, but there are so many options for that Alpine seat. You have, you know, Mercedes reserve driver and Alpine endurance driver, Mick Schumacher, who has Formula One experience. Mm-hmm. You have Alpine's reserve driver, Jack Dewan, who has been with Alpine for a hundred years. And then you have options like Botas or Zhou Guan Yu, um, who is looking at a seat or is looking to be a reserve driver next year because Zhou might be screwed. Yeah, I think that uh, I, I don't see them going with Joe. Uh, I could see them pulling him as a reserve driver mm-hmm. um, and promoting one of their other reserve drivers, whether it's uh, Dohan or Schumacher, into the actual seat and keeping uh, Zhu on standby. Uh, I don't see him. I don't see him being their choice. Uh, he's no, had I a couple good performances, but I, I don't think that if you're looking for if you're looking to get points, I don't see him being the we need points driver. Yeah. And they're just like, like I, I've said this a million times that like they just, he hasn't been in a good enough car to showcase his talents. Cause he's clearly a very talented driver and he's probably right. also incredibly underrated. Um, but the car he's in now at Sauber is just so terrible that, you know, it, it really has hampered his entire formula one career. Yeah. Completely agree. Um, you can't pick a driver based off what you think they will do in another car. You kind of have to go with the results that are out there. And it sucks for him that his career has been in a car that isn't showing results. And I don't think it's his fault, but when the teams are looking for who their driver is going to be, they've got to go with experience and they've got to go with results. And I think that Zhu will either uh, be a reserve driver and maybe get a chance in a faster car or do some test laps in a faster car. And someone will pick, pick up on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But until that point, I don't see him being a a huge pull for teams. Yeah, and I mean, that's happened before. SMN Ocon took a year off um, between seats and he served as a reserve driver um, Mm -hmm. because, you know, he he lost out on a seat in one of the, you know, bigger, you know, driver market shuffles a few years ago. So it's it's not, you know, like this could be the end of his career, but it's, it's not looking good even with his, you know, hefty financial sponsorship backing. So yeah um yeah i i wouldn't i would be surprised if we didn't see him again but i wouldn't be surprised if we don't see him next year um yeah yeah speaking of next year we have seen and i i I woke up to this while you know sleeping in the wilderness for for two (laughs) days um with you know with the first hike of my summer or second hike third second hike um, but but first overnight they all of blend the together at some point it's, anyways it's so much hiking i woke up to, to the news that liam lawson might be in the car for ricardo as early as july which i don't think is going to happen i think that helmet marco has been taking a been taken a little bit out of context but i mm-hmm. do think it's likely that we will see lawson in the car over ricardo next year um you know one of the things that that does ring accurate about helmet marco's statement was that v carb is meant to be a junior team and the point of danny being on the junior team was to see if he could take Perez's seat. And now Perez hasn't really proved since he signed his contract that he should ha- be in, in his own right. seat. So the door could still be open a little bit for, for Ricardo to, to go back to Red Bull, um, whether or not he, you know, he gets a V carb seat with, you know, whatever the hell Perez is doing this week. Um, but it does look like it's V carb or bust for Daniel and that Daniel might not be on the grid next year. Yeah, um, I I wouldn't be surprised if we're at watching the tail end of his F1 career. Uh, yeah. To be honest, he he came back. He had some really great numbers in a very fast car uh, in testing uh, when they put him yeah. in the RB originally. And I think everyone saw those numbers and said, oh, we want Daniel back. It's time to bring Daniel Ricciardo back and uh, brought him back in. But the, the fact of the matter is he's just not performing at the level he was expected to perform. Um, I agree with you. I think he was brought in to put pressure on Sergio Perez's seat. Mm -hmm. uh, And he just hasn't done that. And uh, I think that if you're going to use V-Carb as a, um, as like an upgrade path into Red Bull, I think that you need to make sure that you have drivers that are going to be able to make that upgrade. And they're just going to, 
want to upgrade. Yeah. So, and in other news, Max Verstappen has confirmed it to no one's surprise since he has a contract through 2028 that he will be driving for Red Bull in 2025, further dashing Toto Wolff's hopes that he <laughs> will go to Mercedes, you know, now that Lewis is leaving for Ferrari. Yeah, uh, that would be something. And I mean, I think part of Toto Wolff wanting to get him is it's no surprise that uh, Red Bull's car is not the dominant beast it's been in years past. Uh, last right. year, it was unbeatable you had red bull one two the whole beginning of the season and this year um sergio perez has definitely shown us that red bull is not as infallible uh, while max verstappen might still be uh red mm -hmm. bull as a team isn't and i think red bulls noticed that too uh they've got max testing out old rb cars trying to get trying to figure out why they were better um so I think there's some interesting stuff coming out of Red Bull, and I think that's going to come into my picks for this week, too. But we'll get there. Uh, yeah. Very interesting to see Red Bull trying to acknowledging that something has gone wrong down the way and trying to figure out what that is. Yeah, and I mean, we're very fortunate as Red Bull fans that Max is basically a driving <laughs> savant and can, you know, make anything happen out of out of the this Red Bull car, which is still maybe not the fastest car on the grid, but is one of the most dominant right now still because he's just so difficult to beat. And, you know, obviously, obviously right. as I said in um, the Spanish Grand Prix, you know, reaction, like Max didn't struggle to win that race because Lando was still so far behind him. But you know him going up against Lando you know in a true fight I still think Max has the edge based on the experience that he has in the car and just his you know raw scale and talent agreed um and I think that he's gonna have that for a long time on most if not all of the grid but uh it doesn't help to have a car that you know can beat anyone in addition to so Red Bull's right, exactly. gonna hope to get back to that as soon as possible Exactly, exactly. But, you know, looking back on back when Red Bull's dominance was a little bit more absurd than it is now, last year's Austrian Grand Prix, which also known as track limits <laughs> trauma, um, <laughs> there were over 1200 incidents of potential track limits violations with nine drivers receiving penalties at the end of the race, including Espen Ocon, who got to 30 seconds in total. Which is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Just like, to put that out there. Yeah, that, that's that's so many incidences of track limits just stacking on top of each other. And then with right. the new way that drivers are penalized this season, like if we had last year's race with this year's driver mm -hmm. penalties for things like track limits, it would be even it would have been even worse. It could have been up to 60 seconds, which yeah. considering, you know, never before now have you know, Formula One car has been so close um, where, yes, we do have a lot of times where on shorter tracks, we will see a lot more cars in the, in the backfield get lapped. Um, but for the most part, the, the margin from one to 20 is not as far as it has been, you know, 15, 20, right. 30 years ago. So that's, you know, pretty wild to get that many penalty seconds um, in, you know, in a race, but we will not have that issue to the same extent this year because they have put gravel traps on those turns that everyone was getting penalized for um, and it also adjusted the track limits line on one of the other turns. Uh, I think adjusting the track limits line is exactly what they need. I think we're going to see at least two drivers go into that gravel trap on oh, race day. Fully. Yeah, fully there there will be so. there will be plenty of those and we have two actual race days because it is it is a sprint. True. Yeah, last year Max won Max did the double is Red Bull's home race, so I think that that you know gives Max a little bit of point in favor because um, mm -hmm. they they know this track pretty well. Mm -hmm. But it is another short track, another really fast lap, and so we are going to be in for a pretty big show, even if we have to suffer through a sprint and I have to wake up at three o'clock in the morning on Saturday right. to watch it. Ugh. Yeah, um, gonna be honest, I'm gonna watch that one on replay. <laughs> Oh, of course you are. Um, I'm just the absurd one who's going to, you know, actually wake up for it. True. Because um, it's, you know, yes, it's three o'clock in the morning, but it's only like 30 minutes and then I can go back to sleep for four hours. Right. Yeah. So let us dive in to um, this year's Austrian Grand Prix. 
it's time for predictions. And we have a lot because not only do we have mine and Adam's, but Emily also sent me hers um, from her travels gall- gallivanting across South America on her <laughs> way back to the United States. Um, so as you know, listeners, we have uh, we keep track of, of pole, podium, P10 for sprints. We do sprint pole, sprint podium, and P8. And we have points. Adam, you will not be featured in the points, but you will be <laughs> our guest picker for your predictions. Honorary points. Honorary points uh, for pole, you get one point for podium, which you have to get the entire podium correct because we're absurd about that. Um, but that's five oh my points. Gosh. And if you get P8 or P10, you get three points because that's a really hard pick. So let us start off with the sprint portion of the weekend. Adam, who is your pick for sprint pole? I, uh, a little out of left field, I think Oster, Oscar Piastri is going to do it. Um, okay. McLaren, McLaren have been aggressive, they've been getting faster. Uh, they seem to be getting faster while everyone else is getting slower. And we've seen Oscar Piastri and Lando Norris right up on each other. Um, and while while I think that Lando Norris is the better driver in a full race, I think that Oscar Piastri might surprise us in uh, some qualifying. So Interesting. I think Oscar Piastri is going to take sprint qualifying. And I picked his teammate. I picked Lando Norris. Um, yeah. just purely, purely based on a speed and B vibes. Um, and Emily also picked Lando for her sprint okay. pole prediction. Lots of McLaren. Yes. It's going to be lots of papaya in our picks, which probably means Max is going to be like, Oh no, no, you didn't. I... And, uh, exactly. and, and he's, he's going to take pole anyway. And we're going to miss out on what is probably the easiest way for us to get points <laughs> because we don't, right. other than my clean sweep and Emily getting, uh, her P10 pick last week, we don't do so well in these predictions that's fair yeah all right who is your pick for the sprint podium uh sprint podium i think it's going to be max verstappen Mm -hmm. uh number one i just if it's this season it's his race to lose and i think he would have to do something wrong uh which we've seen him do but i think being at home is going to be a lot less of a chance of him messing up so I think yeah. Max Verstappen is going to come in one. Um, I think Oscar Piastri, who's going to start in pole, is going to finish in second. I think they're going to okay. be close. I think it's going to be a really good race. Um, and I think that I'm torn. Uh, I think that George Russell is going to surprise us. I think he's going to be right up there. But I think that Lando Norris is the one who's actually going to finish P3. Okay. Okay. So you're picking George, but you think realistically it's actually going to be Lando. Uh, Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We we shall see. And George will I us. I went with like you a max win. Um, I have Lando also losing out on pole, and I have mm-hmm. an Oscar Piastri P three. Okay, so you got the double McLaren. I got the I got the McLaren double, and then um, who is going to be your P eight pick? I I think that my P eight is going to be Fernando Alonso. Okay, that'll be fun. Um, yeah. We like to see Fernando up in the points. Um, and so hopefully Aston Martin can rebound from where they've been the last couple of weeks. Yeah. I picked, where'd I pick? I picked, I picked George. So you have George okay. in either P3 or P4. I have him down in P8. in P8. Okay, I see it. So we shall see. And then Emily, um, who purely picked most of her picks based off vibes this week, went with Oscar. Oh, her and I are going to have words after this. Mm-hmm. Yes, we, we, we shall we shall see, we who, shall see who made the right pick. Exactly. Yeah. And the the other thing to note for this this year versus last year's race is last year's race was a little bit wet. Um mm-hmm. and this year it doesn't look like there's going to be much rain in the forecast. There's like a twenty percent chance of rain on Sunday, but it doesn't look very likely. It looks like it's gonna be a dry weekend. Yeah, that's going to help with track limits going throughout. We can only hope because last we year's can... track limits nonsense was ridiculous. Fingers Even though we, we had Professor Hamilton, um, the the chief tattletale on, on the grid. So um, who, yeah. who knows what he will be uh, kept occupied with uh, this week. We shall see. All right. So going into Sunday's race, who is your pick for pole position? Um, I think that Sunday's race is going to be Max Verstappen on pole. Um, yes. He's shown in the last couple of weeks that he's uh, day one and day two, he's not all the way up there, uh, whether that's a strategy thing or whether that's just it takes him a few days to fully get into it. But by the time we see the race, I think he'll be he'll be ready to start at the top. 
Yeah, exactly. I also have. Yeah. So it is a clean sweep for a Max Verstappen poll prediction on this week going off track podcast okay. with Emily also picking Max. Um, so we shall hopefully <laughs> be right and hopefully at least get the Grand Prix poll um, exactly. point. Um, watch, watch it be flipped and Max gets the the, ball the, and, La- yeah. and Lando gets or one of the McLarens, um, Lando or Oscar gets the Grand Prix poll. I feel like yeah. that could happen. All right. I, so I wouldn't is- be surprised. Yeah, I I really think it's like one of those three drivers. Oscar struggled a little bit last week in Spain, so hopefully he will be able to to rebound a little bit and catch a little back um back up to Lando. All right, who is your podium for the Grand Prix? Uh my podium, I'm going to go with Max Verstappen, I think Lando Norris, and then I think Oscar Piastri. Okay, so you um, have I think you have my sprint podium. I have your sprint podium. Yeah. Um, in the long in the long form race, I think that there's too much time uh, for the McLarens not to do well. So that's that's true. And too yeah. much time for Max Verstappen to just be five seconds ahead of everyone else. So yeah, I mean we'll 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 see how how it goes. I mean the the short track does mean that there will be you know more opportunities to run into traffic behind as you know these mm-hmm. drivers at the front have to overtake. But we'll True. see. Um, we my see. podium is going to be Max, of course. Um, of course. We're going to have Lando up in P2. And for some reason, I picked Carlos for P3. Um, okay. Which also kind of goes against my, you know, who's going to do a dumb prediction. So mm-hmm. I don't really know what I'm going with here. But for some reason, I'm picking Carlos. I'm hoping Carlos picks it back up. Um, and that he and, Aust- and uh, that he and Charles stop fighting each other and start fighting the rest of the teams on the grid because Ferrari um, is running a little bit close to McLaren in P3 of the Constructors' ch- standings. And McLaren is on a charge. Right. Yeah. And then Emily's podium. Emily is going against what you and I have picked. And she has picked a Lando Norris victory. Followed okay. by Max Verstappen in P2 and then a Lewis Hamilton P3. Ooh, that's bold. Mm-hmm. It is a bold choice. So it's either going to be we're right or she's right. Yeah. And then who is your P10 pick? Um, My P10 pick, I just seeing how he's been, I think that uh, he's going to sign the contract and he's going to be a little too comfortable. I think Sergio Perez is going to fall from grace. Even more I than he already has lately. Even more than he already has lately. Um, he's not fighting for his drive as much as he was. I think that we're going to see that get, uh, not necessarily get to him, but I don't think we're going to see that motivator uh, that's been there all season. Yeah, no, he, he's, he's been on this, this streak that he has done pretty much every year for the last three years. And as a Red Bull fan, it's exhausting. And we'd love to have more of that little consistency of the one, two. Mm -hmm. Um, But I can, I can see Perez being at the tail end of the points. He was P eight last week. P 10 could be where he ends up being, even though expectations would definitely want to put him higher up the standings. I think part of that too, is the other teams seem to be getting faster while Red Bull is not. And while Max Verstappen can uh, overcome that purely on sake of being Max Verstappen, yeah, um, I don't think Perez has that same ability as a driver, so yeah, I think exactly. we're gonna, I think we're going to see him fall back a little bit. Yeah, so I don't disagree with you. I picked for my P10. I picked Mister. I just got a a new contract extension that I probably don't necessarily <laughs> deserve. So I went with Lance Stroll, um, and then Emily went on the other side of the Aston Martin garage and picked Fernando. So there's okay. every chance that one of us will be right <laughs> and one of us will be wrong or one of us will be you. So That's we'll see. Very fair. Yes. All right. So now we get into the little bit more fun predictions. What is your biggest surprise for the Austrian Grand Prix? Um, my biggest surprise, I I think that with all the talks and rumors going on, it's going to light a fire under Yuki Tsunoda's butt. I think we're going to see him uh, finish not terribly high, but higher than is normal. I think that we could okay. see him in, I think we could see him top six, top seven. Oh, that could be really interesting. Yeah. I like that thought. Um, all right. My biggest surprise is I think that Alex Albon is due for a strong weekend. Um, you know. True. Williams has has been I mean has, Williams has been struggling a lot a bit but I think that Alex Albon it, it's it's time for him to move further up you know into the points let's let's get him you know 
seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there. That that Williams, I mean, that Williams is like not the fastest car, so this might not be the weekend for it, but I, I feel like he could have a decent weekend. Yeah, I, I think it's about time for him. Yeah, and who is your dumb of the week going to be? Does it count if I think they're going to do something dumb, but I think they're going to do it intentionally? Say more. Uh, I think it's been too many races since we've seen Kevin Magnuson truly stand up for his teammate and uh, take one for the team. Ah, so so, so you think that he's gonna he's gonna be the uh, human wrecking ball, Kevin Magnuson? I think he's the... gonna be the human wrecking ball. I think he's gonna do something that the FIA can't ignore, and I think he's finally gonna hit twelve points on his license. So you uh, think he's gonna get his race ban? I think he. I think he's gonna get his race ban, but I think it's gonna be an intentional decision out of the Haas garage. Very interesting. I cannot wait to see if that actually happens or not, because that could, I I could definitely see something like that. Yeah. And then my dub of the week is, like I said, I, for some reason I picked Carlos on my podium, but I also have that Ferrari is going to do something stupid as my dub, <laughs> uh, because I feel like Carlos and Charles are still fighting out whatever had gone on between them in Spain um, mm -hmm. that they have been fighting about for days. And, you know, Charles was on team. Well, Carlos just, you know, wanted to have a good home weekend, but, you know, I'm still a right. Ferrari driver and Carlos is like, I had the faster car. So I think that we're still going to see some drama between them. And I think that if they qualify near each other, then that's pretty much guaranteed to happen. Yeah, I, I think that they'll uh, they'll race it out, but I don't know if any, either of them will uh, do anything necessarily dumb uh, we'll see. in the pursuit of that. But we'll see. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, and I mean, there's every chance that Ferrari strategy will do the dumb for them because that is, you know, <laughs> that's what if, they do. If it's not if it's not the drivers, it's going to be the strategy team. It <laughs> is. Yeah. So, what are your final thoughts on the Austrian Grand Prix? Um. I think it's going to be a really good race. I think that uh, I think that we're going to see at the beginning of the race, or, or at least the beginning of the weekend, uh, people saying way inside because they're worried about those track limits. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's going to take until about the sprint race where people actually become comfortable uh, racing on the true line. So uh, I think that's going to be a, an interesting start to it. Um, I think we're definitely going to see a couple cars go into the gravel. Uh, hopefully none of them out of the race, but... Uh, we're going to see some cars go off, and I think it's going to be—I think it's going to be a really good, exciting race. I think that it's going to be—it's uh, going to be just a good quality race. Yeah, I mean the you know the Red Bull Ring always provides great racing, so I think mm -hmm. that we are definitely in store for some excitement. Um, and I, I do think you know we've been lucky the last few races that the the finish rate has been as high as it has been, so we True. might be due for for a couple of DNFs. Um, but I I really I'm really excited to see how it goes this weekend. I'm also you know as as we have been evaluating this year's sprint format, um, I am very curious to see how this format plays since we haven't had a sprint in a while after having you know back-to-back -back sprints in um mm -hmm. china and miami um so either i'm going to be pleasantly surprised at how this weekend goes or i'm going to be super annoyed once we get to our uh, reaction podcast that we'll record on sunday right <laughs> yeah well, that is it for the podcast. Like I said, we will be recording our uh, Austria reaction on Sunday. Adam will still be with us. Excellent. Um, and the episode will be out on Monday. Follow us on going.off.track on Instagram for updates throughout the weekend. This has been the Going Off Track podcast. And uh, thanks for going off track with us. Thanks for going off track. <laughs>